Mm. Welcome every, everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, welcome to this fireside chat with uh, the Honorable Sharon Burke. Um, we're about to start, and but before we do, um, we want to we want to say that we do have um, simultaneous translation services. So you can click on the um, on the icon at the base of your screen, where you see a globe, and that will give you access to a simultaneous translation service to Spanish. So the objective of this uh, fireside fireside chat, sorry, is to discuss the interconnections between agriculture and peace in the context of the United Nations World Science Days for Peace and Development, which aims to bring science closer to society by highlighting some specific aspects and possible solutions provided by science, technology, and innovation to some of the major global challenges that society is facing today. To, to begin, uh, I would like to give a, be, a brief introduction um, of the Honorable Sharon Burke um, career. She is a leading expert in climate security, energy security, defense, and critical mineral issues, and served as Assistant Secretary of Defense for Operational Energy and Programs, and is the founder and president of Ecospherics, a research and advisory firm. Throughout her career, she has worked to balance national security and environmental sustainability with a focus on ideas that scale through public policy. She has been a leader at several civic organizations, including the Center for a New American Security, where she initiated natural security, nat natural security a novel policy research program. She has also served in the US government in Congress, the State Department during the George W. Bush administration and the Pentagon, most recently as the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Operational Energy in the Obama administration, and as part of the Biden-Harris presidential transition team. Sharon is a real intellectual shiro. When Age of Consequence came out, she was one of the leading voices in that breakthrough documentary. Welcome, Sharon. Thank you very much for, for being here. Now, this- I'm to join you. Thanks. This fireside chat is also open to people outside CMIT. So I'm gonna give a brief introduction uh, of Dr. Bram Goverts, who is Director General and CEO at CMIT. He is an international authority in maize and wheat cropping systems who works for a successful transition to sustainable intensification of small scale, small scale farming in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Govert advises public, private, and social organizations worldwide, and is an active member of research groups and programs, including the Sustainable Development Solutions, Net Solutions Network, the Knowledge Systems for Sustainability Platform, the A.D. White Professor at Large Program at Cornell University and the American Society of Agronomy. So without further introduction, I would like to um, give the word to Dr. Govert so that uh, you may begin with the, with, with the fireside chat. Thank you. Thanks, Ricardo, and thank you for this wonderful uh, introduction. And once again, uh, thanks, uh, Sharon. I hope it's OK if I say Sharon in this uh, somewhat informal and structured uh, chat uh, for, for joining us. We know you are you're very busy. And, and today is actually a historic day, not because you and I are chatting, but because a couple of things come together that we care a lot about, which is it is uh, uh, as we speak, the COP, the COP is uh, happening in Egypt, of course, on climate change. Uh, also today uh, is part of the uh, the week, the UN week on, on, on science and peace. Uh, so that, that comes also together. And of course, globally, uh, we unfortunately still see conflict unfolding and, and the recent news of the breakthrough uh, of the agreement of the, the, the grain trade uh, agreement between Russia, Ukraine, uh, Turkey, as brokered by uh, the UN. So I think a couple of positive things and a couple of pressures comes together that uh, we both care uh, very, very deeply about. Um, but before I, I, I start to discuss some of those global issues, could, could you tell a little bit um, more about yourself, your journey? How do you end up uh, being uh, the honorable and, uh, and a leading <laughs> voice uh, in, in the complex issues in the nexus of uh, energy, food, uh, and water? It's a good question. And I, I just want to add to your list of, of notables, by the way, the, that there seems to be a, an agreement between the government of Ethiopia and Tigray as uh, brokered by South Africa is also uh, really a good reason for hope, I hope. <laughs> um, for my own career, you know, I was always interested in peace and security. 
and in sort of the fabric of conflict and all the way that root causes weave together. Um, it's funny because I think when I started my career, I certainly never thought I would end up working in the Pentagon. Um, you know, I, I worked at Amnesty International and a number of other places and thought that that was probably more where I would spend my career. But uh, after some years working for a research organization on international energy issues and development, um, an, an organization that doesn't exist anymore, actually, uh, I, I went to graduate school and studied international energy policy and these sort of root causes and Middle Eastern studies and studied Arabic um, and ended up joining the U.S. government federal service through a management training program. And I competed for and got placed in the office of the Secretary of Defense, which is actually not his personal office. It's a big organization that that really drives the policy and the guidance and the oversight of the building and found much to my surprise that I really liked working there for all kinds of reasons, including that it has the real visceral urgency of security there. And it's a very professional environment. So I spent a lot of, of my uh, career working in the national security sector and still bringing the same convictions to the table that you it's not enough to fight a war. You have to know how you're going to build the peace. And that starts before a war, during a war, and after a war, um, or you'll be in a perpetual state of conflict. So I've continued to work towards that and have been a speech writer, have been a policymaker, and most recently have been a senior official at the U.S. Department of Defense, where my job was to create energy security for, for U.S. forces. Um, a lot of it is, I will say this, since I know that you know we're talking today partly to CIMIT as a, as a workforce, as a group of people working together, that I think one of the important lessons I've learned is building networks that from the minute you step into your career, you're building a community for yourself um, of the people that you're going to work together with for the rest of your life. And in my case, I have several interlocking communities, peace building community and national security community and energy, food, water, minerals community. Um, and I really enjoy sitting in the middle of all of those and figuring out how to weave them together. And most recently, my my uh, in addition to the organization that I created um, to do this work, because I didn't see any place where it was being done, um, my most recent job with the Biden Harris transition was really probably you know one of the biggest honors of my career, because the way that works is that they pull in a few experts to help them figure out what's the blueprint for the coming administration, uh, and it was just a gift to be able to look at government in that way about what would you do if you were handed a governing capacity and uh it was it was a great community to be a part of and i and i hope that uh, well and i think the things they've put in motion and now taken to new heights are are really laudable including in the food security space uh, thanks a lot, and, and we hope we can pull you in somehow as a as an expert to make a blueprint of what what would you do if you lead uh, this this community of, of research centers and and particularly Simit as a as a Wallace Center uh, a Wallace institution we were created for that purpose and and Borlaug once said you cannot uh, uh, you cannot build peace on on empty stomachs so so we have here. Uh, really the, the thought leaders of, of this food security community, of this community that does research and innovation uh, globally with impact locally. Um, if you would describe, what does that mean being a Wallace institution today? What, what How relevant or irrelevant are we uh, in, in this whole conversation? I think food as part of human security and of national security, it has always been true from the very beginnings of human society, it's it's a foundational element of, of all security. So, you know, it, it, you always want to be careful about exaggerating and saying, you know, this time is more than any other time, but this time really is, you know, we are facing global pressures. Everything that's made us successful has also made us vulnerable with biodiversity loss, with climate change, the challenge of having that foundational element of food security has never been harder than it is right now. 
we can feel like we have enough, but we are on a path towards not having enough. So that Wallace vision about the inextricable connection between security and food has never been more true. You know, conflict drives food insecurity, food insecurity drives conflict. It's this terrible um, knot where things are connected. But when we add in climate change and biodiversity loss and pollution and other elements of our modern life, it, it's it's more important than ever to understand how these elements fit together and that you cannot build one without the other. And that conflict often means the absence of food security. So it, the time is now to really understand even more what that means to be a Wallace institution. I for sure feels that his his peace, prosperity, and equity, or his, his call for those three pillars, are are, are more relevant uh, than 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 ever in the environment we are we are working in. Um, and actually, Simit right now is on a, on a journey to to make our uh, new strategy. Uh, how are we going to contribute uh, through research and innovation, but also with the supporting elements of the right talent, uh, the right uh, excellence in operations. Uh, the, the the right resource mobilization, of course, but also our our influence and our and 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 how do we do right partnerships? And 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 one of the elements when you're trying to do such strategic thinking is, of course, and and it reminded me well, you said I was in this big office uh, with the visceral uh, urgency, constantly hammering. But at the same time, that office has been very very good at strategic. So doing the strategic while during doing actually that visceral urgency, how does that happen? And what, what, what can we learn? What can we learn from that? I mean, strategy is all about choices and all about anticipation and forecasting. You, you have to imagine what the future is going to look like. And then think of the ways and the resources that you, you know, you're going to need to get there. Otherwise you're in constant reaction mode. And given the scale of the challenge and also the intricacy of it, because when you're talking about food production, and this is one of the reasons that I really love what Simit does, is that you're talking about not just food security as some abstract concept, but as the, the people and the places where it's created. When you're talking about such a vast challenge with such an intimate and intricate you know, uh, human link at the base of it, you have to be thinking ahead as to where are things going to be, but more to the point, where do you want them to be? And how and how do you get there from here? And that's what I think military organizations, certainly the US military does very well, is this constant evaluation of what might the future look like? What do we want the future to look like? What does security mean? And then how do we get there from here? And then what kind of resources do we need to put in order to, to make those pathways work. And that process is often one of prioritization and trade-offs. And that's just life. You're, you're, you're not gonna be able to do everything to the greatest extent possible. So what are the things you have to do? And strategy is about answering that question in the most useful, uh, productive way. So, so in that sense, uh, any recommendations? What you, you looked at Simit from the outside, and then we have the honor of being a hundred percent peace building organization. We, it, it's not difficult to explain and feel good about work, working for Simit. But, but look, you looking at the outside at Simit, what what would be your top three things that Simit should be looking at? What do you see as our strengths and especially as our big opportunities? I think the top three things that that you should be looking at is is how is climate change going to shift what agricultural production and productivity means 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now? What does the world need in order to be able to produce food in that world? How does that reflect through your research priorities, your research and development priorities? And then the the big one that I again I think is really such an important distinction for Simit is you're not just a science organization, that you're a science organization in partnership with the people that are on the receiving end of the science, and that it's a two way street. So I think you also have to consider as one of your top goals how do you continue to have that dialogue with farmers, so that you affect them but they affect you. 
And what are the ways to make sure that you deepen that and, and the equity that's inherent in that conversation? Um, so, so yeah, it's understanding the future better, um, setting your science and technology goals so that you're true to that future. And then three, making sure that your real strength, which is your hands-on work, is part of that that vision for how you get, uh, you know, a future by mid-century where we can continue to feed the world. Well, I think for me, what already one, I wrote it down. I mean, if I look at the one CGR research and innovation strategy, in order to get there, for sure, we need to be a, a top-notch science organization in partnership with the people and that they influence us and we we influence them and also and also that notion is a very strong very strong message if i look historically at my own career i've always felt very at unease if i look at the previous big food crisis and i have made statements in the past of saying we, we dropped the ball collectively as a as a as a, as a group of organizations that were created to actually avoid through food security that those kind of conflicts like the arab spring and and and, and worse the, the the a couple of wars that came out of that that were stuck people are still struggling from and and there's still migration uh, streams going today to europe and and in a way that we know that part of that was and that, that came out also in the in the in, in that in that fantastic reportage about the, the age of consequences that that it was subsequent drought and and it happened to be subsequent drought on on weed that that actually destabilized some of the of the food system. Um, now I know you were in the middle uh, of of, of in, in important positions at that point. If you look back at that, what would you have done differently? And and what what is the lesson for us today? We cannot drop that ball again. I, I believe if society will simply not allow us. You know, I think one of the mistakes we made is, is that we were thinking about conflict and war as something that happens in stages. You know, that, that you know, I think the mental model that a lot of American, a lot of uh, people in the United States have is World War II, where there's a war, you have a front line, you fight, and then it's over and you rebuild. But what we've seen is that that's not, that's really not the way war ever worked, but it certainly isn't now. Everything is happening all at the same time. So you can't wait to build stability and peace until and and fight right now. It this this is a it's almost what they call what we call in the US, right? A catch-22, where you can't have security without food, but you can't have food without security. You have to be able to build both at the same time. So I think that what I would have gone back, well. There's a longer conversation now about about choices my country has made in the last 20 years about war and peace, but you know we can put that aside for now for another conversation. Aside from that, I would have said we needed to be planning from the very beginning, before a first shot was fired in any conflict. How are we going to build peace, and how are we going to be doing that from day one? Because you will never be able to secure a country if there isn't a way to get water and produce food and have energy from day one. So I would say that we need to be just as good at security building as we are at war fighting. You know, my country invests a lot of money in, in our military and in our ability to fight wars. And we need to be just as good at building peace as we are at fighting wars. Cause it's really hard to undo the damage of war once it starts. And in some ways you never do. So if we aren't putting as much emphasis and money and effort in building peace, then, you know, then we're never going to be able to face these big challenges that we're all trying to face. It seems that at, at the level of a country, the, the best conflict is one that is actually uh, avoided by proactively uh, 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 look at the underlying of the underlying causes and attend them deeply. So if, if we look look at Simmons research. Uh, capacities, biodiversity of maize and wheat. Recently, new crops came on board, sorghum, millet, uh, groundnut, uh, a, a deep understanding of systems research, uh, agronomy, how to how to grow those those plants, but also the whole enabling environment around that. And 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 we have some fantastic scientists with deep systems, systems thinking. And, and we look at everything that is happening out there today. Um, 
do, how, how would you convince a decision maker? How can we convince decision makers that yes, science and technology, science and innovation are part of peace and peace building and avoiding uh, conflict. And we should get as much investment as, as some of those more uh, concrete uh, uh, other things that, that you just mentioned. Uh, and any thoughts on, on how can we communicate better? It seems almost that we should be very easy to attract huge loads of investments uh, with, with the mission we have. And still here we are struggling to do the fundraising. Yeah, I, I mean, it should. Let's be honest here. What you do should be a, you know, more important than, than any other investment that a government is going to make. Okay, so we, we can agree on that. Um, I think the two pieces of it are, are that is on the one hand, you have to document the challenge and the threat um, as well as you can to show exactly how these relationships, these systems problems are unraveling peace and making security um, impossible. But secondarily, I think you have to document your outcomes. You have to be able to show what your success is, because I, I think that's always the hard thing when you say, well, of course you should invest in us. We're, we're creating food. You know, what could be better than that? We help farmers. That's intrinsically good. You need to be able to document and show the outcomes and the successes. And not just that, you know, they, they grew more crops today than they did yesterday, but that systems effect, um, that's really hard for all of us in this space to show that, again, an investment in this is an investment in peace building. And here's why, here's how. But, you know, the good news is I think there are so, there's so much there's so many good decision support tools now and our ability to, to harness data to show that story convincingly is unparalleled, is better. So I think, again, this is a real strength for Summit is that you, know, you have the people in the field working with the farmers, you have the scientists in the lab developing you know, world-changing new ideas, but you also have a policy framework and a way of thinking about the problems. And it's linking those three things that can really be powerful and that policy framework and communicating it and you know and sort of harvesting all the good that's coming from your hands-on work it has to be a part of of how you succeed uh, thanks and and, and recently we, we are very grateful actually to the to u.s government for uh, president biden recently announced a, a substantial investment in accelerating uh, innovation taking all those innovations that the cgr space has and how can we accelerate that uh, towards impact if if uh, and, and and that project is, is led by, by by seek with support of all program directors and 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 uh, the sustainable agri-food systems uh, uh program and then i'm sure maize and wheat and and, and the new crops will play crucial role and and for those online we will discuss that uh, and what that really means uh, a, a little bit in another space and of course we want to bring in innovations from throughout our ecosystem with last mile uh, delivery uh, to, to get them out there and to get data back if you would be a, a, a if we would hire you as a project leader for that project what what would be the first things you you would do given this 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 fantastic opportunity well, I, I mean, I wouldn't presume to tell the experts how to do their job, but I do, you know, want to recognize that the Biden administration, you know, that the president, they had, the administration had already committed something like almost $7 billion to food security and food assistance in 2022, and then announced that an additional $2.9 million at the UN General Assembly. Um, and to me, though, it is really exciting that as they've clarified the nature of that announcement, that it's not just about emergency food aid, although of course that's important. I mean, you can't save the patient. <laughs> you know, you have to save the patient first before you can improve their health. Um, so of course that's really important and necessary. There are, you know, the, the newest report from the FAO and the World Food Program says what there are 19 hotspots that are at immediate risk. So it's really, really important. But to me, what was really exciting was to see pride of place for in, improving food production, improving farming, farming at the farmer level. You know that just to see that and that last mile technology investment. Um, I think again to see that explicitly called out in in by the U.S. government as a place where they're going to invest money. Uh, I think was really encouraging. And again, I would say for Simit, you know, you know your business best, but but bringing in that this is not just an emergency measure that's going to help us right now, 
but an emergency measure that's going to help us with a changing world, with climate change. So how can we leverage this investment that is being made now in an emergency to be one that also builds resilience for all for this longer term emergency that we're all facing? I think that's a really important um, element of, of all this last mile, all the technology, all of the um, farmer improvements that you're working on is that they be uh, accomplishing both of those missions at the same time. And again, that you'd be able to document how this is so and, and what the improvements are. Uh, so that not just so that you can prove it and get more money, but also so that you can replicate it and, and bring it to other, other communities. Uh, talking about other communities, if, if, if you look at uh, our our systems thinking, how can we connect with the energy community? How do we connect with with uh, with the, the, the water community? And then going back to your Amnesty International days, uh, how do we connect with 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 human rights? And how do we connect with with uh, with the individual uh, beyond farmers uh, in our in our work? It's such a good question uh, because I think one of the problems is it's not the way that governments are set up. You know, we're, we're set up to govern one issue at a time, even the United Nations, right? We are set to govern, to focus on an issue at a time, not on the connections between issues and how they all fit together, but you cannot solve a food production problem without solving a water problem and an energy problem and a fertilizer materials problem and a human problem. You know, if you just address them one at a time, um, you know, inevitably you're causing another problem somewhere else or it's an insufficient answer. So uh, I wish I had an easy answer for that, Brahm, about how we how we learn to govern at a systems level, but I feel like it is certainly increasingly acknowledged by organizations like CJIR and by governments like mine, by large organizations like the United Nations that we need to to govern differently. And I think in real time, we're inventing how that works and what that looks like. Thanks a lot. And I think that that was a, a very challenging even statement that, that probably we don't know, but that doesn't mean we don't need to keep uh, trying to, to, to get this right. Uh, bef before I go to, to Natalia uh, uh, to, 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 to highlight some of, of what she uh, saw as, as highlights of this conversation, any last, uh, uh, any last thoughts, anything you want to communicate to this, to this community? Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I, envy your community again because I've, I've spent most of my career in policy circles and I do think it's important I think having frames having good policy you know you can't succeed without it however sometimes you're so remote from the actual challenge so I do I do almost envy all of you envy is not the right word because I don't envy you but I admire a little in a wistful way that you get to actually touch the problem and deliver the solution and work in that in that you know two-way dialogue with farmers um, and that you get to sort of bring that all together about how we think about a problem, how we come up with novel science and technology for solving the problem, and then you actually get to carry it to the field and make it work. It's it's a it's a it's a powerful thing and it's a privilege. So um, for me, the chance to talk to all of you and work with all of you is is just exciting because of that continuum that that you have. So uh, I would say never forget that 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 you're not just thinking about peace or even researching peace, you're delivering it. And and that's, you know, I'm sure it's hard. <laughs> and there are days when it's frustrating. But remember that every increment, every inch that you move is a movement towards long-term peace. And I think that's just really exciting and a privilege. Th thanks, Th thank you very much. And for sure, we feel uh, privileged and we are very thankful also to so many partners. I mean, it's not, it's not only us, it's this network and partnership that we can activate. And, and I think we're gonna and we're gonna have to become even better at those at those partnerships. And, and, and part of the at least I took down a uh, noted down a couple of insights that, that we need to further discuss uh, internally. But I'm I'm really intrigued, uh, Natalia, you're one of our leading uh, women in science and 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 here in name of uh, of the women in science uh, community. 
and, and I was looking at, at, at Sharon's bio and I said, wow, building a new office in the Pentagon. Uh, if we are frustrated with sometimes getting some innovative ideas done, I, I can just not imagine. But uh, Natalia, uh, uh, what, what were your highlights from this conversation? And then, of course, any question from you uh, to, to Sharon? Yeah, thanks, Bram, and thanks, Sharon, for this uh, insightful uh, conversation. It's been really a, a pleasure and also a challenge to, to listen to you <laughs> in the sense that, uh, yes, indeed, every day when we come to work, we, are, we have this sensation of uh, fighting the emergency, but uh, the importance of building resilience. And I think uh, that's a, a very a key message that you that you mentioned the importance also to work uh, in a systemic uh, way uh, and this is really relevant for the scientists because uh, the more we specialize the more uh, uh, focus on little things we are and we forget the the, the environment around us so this has been really um, uh, important in uh, for our own day-to-day uh, -day work but as, as um, Bram mentioned, I mean, it is incredible all the work that you have done. And, uh, and we all know that uh, you have been uh, developing all this work in a quite a, a heavy male environment, I have to say. Yeah. And um, as, as women in science, sometimes we, we feel the, the same threat, you know, that it is hard to convince our colleagues. It, it is hard to be recognized. It is hard to to have the same opportunities as, as many others. No? And, 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 and we, at the same time, we are privileged. There are other communities that are even in, in worse conditions. So I don't know if um, uh, you could share uh, some tips to flourish as a woman and to have, uh, to create such an impact and, um, and change and actually convince the people to build on peace instead of going uh, against the war. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Natalia. I really appreciate um, everything you said and including when you said that it was hard to listen to me, I was like, oh, I know, I wish I could speak better Spanish. I'm so sorry that I don't, but I appreciate that you're letting me speak in rapid fire colloquial English. Um, because if you think I'm hard to listen to now, just listening to me try to speak Spanish would be worse. Um, so yes, the, I've spent most of my career working in the defense sector or, or in the energy world um, also, and both of them are very male-centered worlds. I think, um, first of all, let's be, let's be straight with each other that the burden is on the men on the line to expect more from themselves and each other, that you have to be good allies and you cannot function without the women, the female talent that you have. So if your environment is not welcoming to women, that is on you, not on them. So that's the first thing I would say is that I realize that's not a, an, a, a total answer to your question, but I just wanna to say to the men in the room, that you need to watch other men and yourself and make sure that you're creating a good environment. And that if someone's not, you, you need to be the person that stands up. Um, and, I, and I certainly had that experience throughout my time in the Pentagon where you might come to a moment where it was uncomfortable or where someone wasn't, where, some, where a male colleague wasn't treating you with respect. And it was when the other men in my office and in my life stood up and were my allies that made it possible for me to succeed. Um, having said that, I also think women need to be good to other women. Um, there's a, 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 a Madeleine Albright, the former Secretary of State, who I was very fortunate enough to know and consider a mentor, has a very famous quote on that, that there's a special place in hell for women who don't help other women. Um, I would just say, keep that in mind and that, you know, especially someone my age. Um, I certainly had women who helped me in my career, but the burden on me is to help the women coming up behind me and I take it seriously. So I would say that, think every day about what can I do to help a female scientist succeed today? Whether it's like, I don't know, anything from giving someone prominence on social media to just asking someone how they're doing today to more formal mentorship programs. Um, so that's one thing. I think as far as I never conceived of myself in my workplace as being at a disadvantage. 
and never clipped my own wings, if you know what I mean. Like, I think women, sometimes we find ourselves centering ourselves and being worried about how we're perceived um, or whether or not we're saying things the right way. And I just really didn't think about that. I just said what I thought. And I, I think, oh, I have, I'll tell you the, in a material way, a good story about that. Very early in my career in the Pentagon, when I was still a management trainee, but I had been put in a job that was usually for someone, you know, 20 years older than I was, and was representing my office at, at international meetings and at interagency meetings with other parts of the U.S. government. And I went to the State Department for a meeting, and one of my colleagues, who again was was a, at the time a, a Navy captain, was probably 20 years older than I was, came with me. And when I came back to the office, my boss, uh, who was an Army colonel, took me aside in his office and shut the door. And he said, so I hear from Captain Cotton, his name was Cotton, I thought you should all like that, um, that you sat in the back row. You didn't sit at the table. And, and I sort of shrugged and he said, look, I don't care how you feel about yourself. I don't care what your hangups are when you go home. I don't care what you think. When you go to those meetings, you are representing our office. It's not about you. It's about our office. And you sit at the table. Um, and I think even though at the time I didn't necessarily appreciate getting dressed down, he gave me permission to think of myself as a professional first, not as, at the time, a young civilian woman in a male uniform military environment. I was a professional and I was representing the office. And I think I've gone back to that thought over and over again in my career. In my last job in the Pentagon, I was the rank equivalent of a four-star general but again, had considerably less management experience than a four-star general would, but it didn't matter because that was the job. I was in the job. The president asked me to do the job. It was the job. So I have always found that helpful too, that instead of thinking about me as a person, me as a woman in a place that's male, I am the job and I represent this organization and you represent, I mean, the hope for humanity. <laughs> so, I mean, that's a lot of freight to carry, but that's first. And however you feel about yourself in that environment is second. And I think that always helped me in those environments. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Natalia. And we're going to go all the way to the other uh, uh, side of the globe uh, to, to hear from Amjad. Amjad is one of the members of what we call the Emerging Thought Leaders Group. And uh, uh, they've been carrying a lot of the uh, strategy development and uh, in, in the organization. And, and, and once again, I want to do a shout out to the to, to, to the management and the leadership in CIMIT for, for allowing uh, an empowered group of young thinkers to, to, to come together and, 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 and to bring their thoughts forward. So uh, Amjad, over to you. Thank you so much, Bram. Uh, Honorable Sharon, it's it's a privilege to hear from you and your words of wisdom. Uh, my question is uh, maybe a bit co complex, maybe not complex for you. Uh, what I want to ask you is about the phenomenon of uh, telecoupling. Uh, you know, food, food system disruption at point A in a, in, in a part of the globe is creating uh, security issues in, in a point B, which is not even connected through trade relations. It means also that it's not governed, you know? so. What do you think about such complex relations between food systems, disruptions, and uh, you know peace? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That is a hard question, Amjad. And uh, and I have to say too that I'm really impressed that that the uh, you and your cohort of emerging voices are are playing such an important role in strategy formation. I think it speaks well of the organization that it's empowering. To, you know, because that's the real engine of change <laughs> and and of of any organization's life is the people who are coming up. So I think that's amazing and really laudable um, that 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 you're playing such an important role. And the fact that you asked this question just underscores that. Um, I wish I had the answer to that. I think, though, that that embedded in your question is part of the answer, which is we have to 
do a better job in our in our policy analysis of understanding that that's the case and that the interconnectedness of these challenges um, is part of the challenge itself. And I think, again, we're really lucky to live in the time that we do in some ways. Um, and one of them is, is our ability to collect and analyze large amounts of data, make it possible for us to understand better how an action here might have a result there that's not direct and causal, but is indirect and refracts through other things. So I think we have to do a better job of, of analyzing those challenges up front, because again, um, you have to make choices about where you're going to apply your effort. And if you haven't had that kind of analysis up front of the nature of the challenge, then you won't be addressing that complex link. So I, again, I, I feel like there's a, a, you know, this telecoupling, which is a new word for me, by the way, but I love it. Um, I think there's an, an understanding that that's happening. Now we just need to be willing to invest the money in analyzing it better to understand exactly how that does happen and being willing to get across that jagged causal line to figure out where you make your best investments um, in order uh, to affect change. And, and you know, Brown asked in the beginning, um, well, do we have, do we need new organizations? Do we have, I think that for an organization like Summit and for your one, um, it's so hard to say CGIAR, by the way, I keep wanting to say CGAR, but I bet you don't call it that. Um, but the the links between, I think you have to start with what you control and what you are and and start investigating that telecoupling that's that's in your own control and and looking then for who are the partners you need to work with to break those links or at least to assuage them in in the indirect places where it's not obvious. So you you maybe, you know, you can't control what everyone else is going to do, but you can control how you approach that challenge and invest in the analysis that will help you understand where in those indirect relationships you can apply effort. Thank you so much. Well, back I look to... forward to asking you that question back. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I, I did some effort, of course. You know, I looked at the um, virtual water supply, I mean, uh, the trade, and uh, what happens if drought in sub Saharan Africa or in, maybe in Ukraine, what happens, you know, in the global virtual water cycle? So, I, I see some relations there, but, you know, I it's without funding I did that, but what I think is uh, it's very important to know, you know, the, the couplings and relationship between food system disruption and climate stress at one point and what happens through the, you know, different uh, causal chains in another place. So, uh, of course, I, I appreciate whatever you said is the right yeah, approach. Yeah, and, and, and to be more specific, I am involved in a couple of things where we're trying to do that. Uh, one is that I've been an informal advisor to DARPA, which is uh, uh, the sort of non-conventional R&D part of the U.S. government, that um, they've been developing something called World Modelers, or the model in it is called Cosmos, where they're trying to really develop the ability to model all those complex links and mm -hmm. so they're pushing quantitative measures like precipitation with qualitative measures like household surveys and trying to build an anticipatory model that shows all that complexity. So I think, uh, you know, hopefully there's uptake there. And I know also that the Bezos Earth Fund with its big $10 billion is looking at things like Cosmos. There's also, I've been involved with Water, Peace and Security. Uh, which is a Netherlands-based partnership that's trying to do a similar integrated assessment model of water and the relationship between water and security. And it brings in things like maternal health, all of that. So I think there's some really interesting efforts there. And I know that Brahm spoke to the Bezos Earth Fund. So hopefully there's there's some um, throughput there as far as how they're going to help move that ability to understand the links forward. Thank you, Sharon, and, and, and thank you, uh, Amjad, and, and, and we're very proud that actually our own kindy is part of some of those uh, of those uh, yes. modeling, and modeling efforts, and is well appreciated uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the... That's in the right. Community. I forgot about that. Thank you for reminding me. Kindy played a really important role in, in that DARPA project and in helping it be something that was true to life and not just, you know, a, a mathematical model built in the air. So Kindy played a really important role.
Thank you. Uh, with that, I, I would like actually to fly now all the way over virtually uh, to uh, Africa. And uh, we have Michael on the line, I believe, if, if everything goes well, technically, uh, for, for a question uh, as another member of the Emerging Felt Leader Group. Over to you, Michael. Thank you very much, Bram. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, sorry, I cannot turn on my camera. I have some hardware problems. I don't want to seem impolite, uh, so please apologize. Uh, yeah, I have also a question. Um, thank you very much to the very interesting discussion uh, where we learn a bit more about the connecting these different seemingly uh, not uh, connected uh, worlds, energy, peace, and food security. And in the discussion, uh, you mentioned uh, climate change, biodiversity, and food security as uh, vulnerabilities. Um, so my question, it aligns a bit with Amjad's question. Um, for the for first two, climate change and biodiversity, we have a sort of uh, global governance system. I mean, you mentioned there's a COP uh, right now ongoing in Egypt. There will be a COP for biodiversity at the end of this year. Do you think we need something similar for the global food system? Um, and if if you believe we need something like that, how do you think it should look like? So actually works. Thank you very much. Thanks, Michael. And I mean, it's it's an age old question. I think that that it's always should we build something new because the full dimensions of a problem are not being captured by the current institutions or should we adjust the institutions we have? Um, I think it's always a hard uh, a hard problem about uh, which one is the right one. I um, and to be honest with you, I can't pretend that I'm consistent on that, Michael. Like if you ask me tomorrow, I might say, yeah, we need an entirely new organization. But today I feel that it's more practical to work with the institutions you have and try to make sure that they are adjusted for, for the, the challenges because building whole new international institutions is difficult. And particularly, um, I think, you know, we're heading into a time of constricted resources. So building an entirely new institution probably isn't practical. And then, you know, on top of that, there's a, the, the competitive, um, uh, the global competition that's going on between the United States and China and others um, might make it very difficult to create a, a new institution that's going to really serve the issues and not somebody's interests um, in that competition. So I think we're better off, you know, and we, there are a lot of international food organizations and food security organizations that do a good job, but I get what you're saying, probably not good enough when we're talking about food security writ large and all these, these interconnections uh, and the elements of future and forecasting. So the question is, how can we make them better? And then more to the point, how can you embed as a really important organization and part of a network of organizations, how can you embed in what you do a different way of operating that influences how they operate? So in other words, you incorporate all these changes that need to happen into the way that you look at the future, into your strategy, and then you influence how they interact with you. Um, so I think... I think you should start with what's in your control, which is how does Simit operate? And, and then how do you operate within your own network? And then we can talk about how these other organizations need to change. But I guess, as I said today, my feeling is no, we don't need to create anything new. I might feel that way tomorrow too, just because I think it's not an auspicious time to talk about an entirely new bureaucracy um, for all kinds of reasons. But that doesn't mean that we can't build new mechanisms within the organizations that exist. We have to. Thank you, Sharon, for, for that. And uh, we, we have a couple of uh, more minutes, uh, five to be to be exact, uh, for uh, some additional uh, questions uh, from uh, the public. So at this point, uh, if you have any question, please uh, uh, put it in the chat or uh, do uh, uh, use the Q&A uh, bottom or just uh, send, send me a, send me an uh, uh, an email uh, and and we just got one uh, one unfortunately we cannot open the camera or the or or or, or the or at this point so if you can put your uh, questions in the chat and I will be very happy uh, to 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 read to read them out. Um, uh, Sharon, I, I just got a question here uh, um, coming in. Uh, being being a, a, a young woman scientist from the south, uh, how 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 can we contribute uh, or how can I? Um, 
not me, but how, uh, the, 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 the person that asked the question, how can I contribute to, to, to creating peace from my very small research, uh, research uh, program? I, I mean, on some level, it'd be presumptuous for me to say how, um, in a, you know, I, I'm not in your shoes, um, but if you take it with a grain of salt, how sitting from, you know, where I'm sitting, um, I think whatever your small piece is that you're doing that you think is small, that is, that is how you contribute to peace. I mean, peace is rarely delivered in broad strokes, right? It is a game of inches and, you know, everybody that's that's making that little inch of progress is part of what adds up to a big piece. So um, I would say that I don't know exactly what you do, but I am I have very strong conviction that you are moving us forward. And it may feel small to you, but everything is small when it comes to peace building. It's how it aggregates that matters. So I would say have confidence that you as a scientist working in this field are inherently building peace. You're inherently building peace. In, and especially with climate change and biodiversity loss, the pressure on this is mounting. So everything that you do, no matter how small it feels, that moves us towards resilience in this space is a contribution to peace. So thank you. I mean, thank you for being a scientist in this space, it matters. It's a material difference. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. And uh, in the meantime, we've got another question uh, that came in he uh, that came in here. Uh, how to bring our efforts for peace and food uh, sufficiency uh, translated from strategy to culture with ordinary citizens, the, the everyday person who's not involved or necessarily sensitive uh, to uh, our to our vision? How, how do we convince them to be an active uh, agent uh, in, in, in the effort? Him I think, her, yeah, I mean, that's a great question, Marcella. I think that um, uh, I am not a scientist. I don't know if you all got that, but I am not. And I will say that I think sometimes scientists and engineers undervalue uh storytelling and um di discernment what i would call discernment which is it's a big world of information out there and there's a big stack of stuff how do you know which things really matter and what really matter to people and that's you shouldn't undervalue that skill set so the fact that what you're doing is important and intrinsically important on a daily basis you still need to convince people to go along with you and to give you money so you also need to invest in, in telling the story of why this is important and communicating the story out through all the many means that we have these days to communicate with people, um, communicating the story and discerning, you know, you've got a world of data and information, but which piece is really important to people and valuing that as a skill. So I would say STEM, 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 I get it. It's really important. The world's not going to move without it, but it should be like STEMs with storytelling on the end of it, because you as scientists have to be able to communicate how important what you're doing is and why it's important, or people won't care and value it in their lives. And the thing is, or they won't know, like I think all this supply chain disruption that Americans have been seeing, um, they don't know how to connect it back to what's important and what's valuable and what needs to be invested in unless you tell them. So that has to be part of your work. Very clear message to do to do more storytelling. Uh, another question is on your your perspective in on incorporating collaborating with impact entrepreneurs, specifically uh, the smaller ones, those that work in the field into this conversation and vision, uh, and to cause uh, the greatest impact uh, with them being at the table. Um. So I think, Sarah, if I understand, you're asking me, is that what I think? And I'd say yes, I do. I think. I think that, but but it's not separable, right? Because it's it's not just you're working with farmers and that's great, um, because then you you could just be you know the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Extension Service, which is good. It's wonderful. It's that you're connecting all of it, a vision for peace, and you know your founding vision as a Wallace organization for peace, connected to science and technology, connected to the users, the small, the impact entrepreneurs, and the fact that you're not just trying to deliver something to them and that you never have been, that it's always been part of your organization, 
that they deliver to you too. And that, that back through that whole chain, they have a say. So it's all of it. It's not just that, that field work and that impact entrepreneur, it's that whole connection, that whole continuum that I think is what, what's really um, such a strong comparative advantage for your organization and so important about your work. Thank you, Sharon. And, and we have uh, around five more questions here. Unfortunately, uh, we have to we have to wrap this very uh, interesting uh, uh, seminar up at this point. So, Sharon, I'm going to give you uh, uh, last thoughts to express, and with that, uh, we 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 will have to say goodbye. Over to you. Oh, you know, it's I think this it's sometimes it's hard to stay optimistic because I think the scale of challenges that we face right now, um, you know, that we want to deliver more development and more modernity to more people in the world. And I feel like my country owes that to the world. Um, but at the same time, the modern economy is draining the life out of the future, that that can be overwhelming and it can be um, really just gutting. It can be depressing, right? Just the scale of that challenge. But I think two of the ways that, that I, I, stay optimistic that I hope um, all of you do too, is the one is that we're here now. And, you know, our time is now to make a difference. So let's get busy. And then the second is, is that people like you actually have your hands on the solution. And at the very first time I heard Brahm talk about how your how you know his vision for integrating climate change into everything you do and making sure that people 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 50 years from now, will have what they need to cultivate. It just was exciting and, and it gave me hope, you know, that that we can be innovative for peace and for the future. So that tangibility of your mission, I think, is something that certainly keeps me optimistic. So it's hard, but um, I mean, again, we're here. We have to do our best and you are lucky enough to be in a place where you can do your best. So I wish you all great luck and it's really a privilege for me to be able to speak with you thank you sharon and for sure for me big takeaways that we, we have the privilege of being with farmers of being close to tra traditions and culture and we can together build uh like somebody said uh, one seat at a, a time building peace <laughs> one seat uh, at a time so thanks you all uh, for being part of this conversation and and i would say this is uh, this, this this is just the start for another step uh, I wish you all a very good uh, rest of the day for those uh, at this side of the world, but of course also a fantastic afternoon or a great evening with uh, your your family, friends, or with your with your with your book, your inspiration, and uh, uh, see you in the next conversation. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Thank you.